Okay, we're going to start the session now. So I'd like to welcome everyone once again to our webinar uh, that MBMA is putting on here called Sustainability for Metal Buildings. I'm Dan Walker and I serve as the Associate General Manager for MBMA and I'll be acting as a moderator for today's presentation. This is just the first webinar in a three-part series we'll be giving on the subject of sustainability over the next several months. And it's intended to be an introduction to this subject. MBMA has done a great deal of work in this area and we've developed all the tools and data you'll need to make sustainability a part of your sales strategy. We've got a great story to tell and we've been able to show that metal buildings outperform nearly every type of construction in speed of fabrication, construction, economics, durability, and now sustainability. Today's presenter is Mr. Jay Johnson, who is a lead accredited professional and has served as the Director of Architectural Services for MBMA for the last nine years. Jay is actively involved in the development of national green codes and standards and is currently serving as a consultant to the ASHRAE 90.1 Energy Standard Committee. Jay is responsible for the development of MBMA's environmental product declarations along with our own active sustainability committee. This webinar is intended to be an introduction to the subject of sustainability and is the culmination of several years worth of work and a great deal of investment by the MBMA members and our sustainability and staff. All attendees are muted at the beginning of the presentation, but feel free to use the question dialog box or the chat feature in GoToWebinar. We'll be monitoring that throughout the next hour and a half and uh, we will be leaving room at the end of the presentation to take your questions. So without further ado, I'd like to transfer control of the webinar to today's speaker, Mr. Jay Johnson. Thank you, Dan, for the introduction and for those of you who are listening in on this webinar. The following outline of the learning objectives uh, that we will uh, review and also the general outline of how we'll tackle these various topics. So Jay, I'm we will seeing, refer I'm to seeing your PowerPoint slides, Jay. I think you need to show the other screen. Okay. How is that? Much better. All right. Well, back to the learning objectives. We'll refer to the common terms used when designing for green building construction today. We'll have a high-level review of the many metal building attributes and how majority of these attributes contribute to the green and sustainable design concept. A number of MBMA resources are now available to validate and address the various sustainable traits of buildings, whether they are to be used as standalone resources to promote the use of metal buildings or with the provisions of the green building codes, standards, and rating systems. Lastly, we'll touch upon the common themes of the green codes and the rating systems. However, due to time limitations, uh, we'll uh, not get into the individual provisions. Uh, that level of detail will be reserved for the next two webinars uh, that will focus in on two of the major topics. So let's attempt to define sustainability and correlate this to the general and then for the metal building projects. Sustainability has been a moving target to define in the green building provisions. It seems like every code cycle or rating system cycle tends to expand on what they feel sustainability means in the construction world. However, oftentimes two definitions are quoted from the onset and in various presentations like this one here to just give a broad overview on what could be or would be considered sustainable. One that I find most useful would be from the Webster Dictionary where it states that sustainability is being able to be used without being completely used up or destroyed. Now then we have the UN Brundtland Commission has a similar definition but focuses in on sustainable development 
not sustainable development in the construction realm, but more uh, broadly um, defined. Uh, they stated, one, that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. And after reviewing the various slides and uh, information in today's webinar, I believe we can easily say that metal buildings is truly a sustainable choice in the construction market. And then we also have the overall sustainability concept that you may have heard, uh, sometimes labeled as a three-legged stool. I uh, held back on including a three-legged stool image, but the uh, general there is a social, economic, and environmental considerations, or three legs. And where they ultimately intersect uh, is the uh, concept of sustainability. The green codes and rating systems tend to focus more on the environmental side of the equation, and that is where uh, my focus will be today with you all. Nonetheless, uh, we do know that MBMA members are committed to the big picture of social, economic, and environmental principles of sustainability. I've already used some of these terms, but often green building, sustainable building, high performance green building are all used to refer to sustainable construction. So I may refer to these or use different terms to switch things up a little bit out of habit. You may not be aware of this, but many of your attributes for metal buildings are inherently sustainable. Metal building construction has always led to environmentally friendly design, manufacturing, use of the building, even towards the end of life of the building, even before the green movement became the latest craze. Whether it is from raw materials and products being shipped from the manufacturer's plants to be formed, shaped, manufactured, fabricated into a metal building or the various components to the construction of the building, it's being put in use, maybe more towards the uh, end of life or during the use it can and would be remodeled or expanded upon. And ultimately, in the end, it would eventually be dismantled and recycled, meaning all these steel components. And I'm sure many of the other components within the building as well. As we are aware, there are many solutions to meet the needs of the architects, designers, and owners. Now, these buildings can be built to incorporate green construction design and principles that exceed that of the base building codes and energy codes. From a metal building manufacturer's role, the metal, the metal building envelopes components typically center around the primary framing, secondary framing, and the roof and wall cladding. And each of these, as you'll see, will contribute to the overall big picture of having a more environmentally friendly construction option available to designers and, and architects specifying buildings. Additional items that would improve the building from an um, energy efficiency level would be the thermal properties of insulation and fenestration such as windows, doors, and skylights. All right, let's transition now to list the, a number of attributes for metal buildings and then we'll correlate how these items are referred to in the green building construction world and also how to contribute to the uh, overall principle of sustainability. I have eight slides to review that will address uh, the various features. Now this list is not all inclusive and some of these items may not be considered sustainable, but as I was running through the various attributes characteristics, traits, uh, what have you, of metal buildings, it really does uh, feed into how environmentally friendly we are. 
As you know, all buildings are custom engineered, detailed, and manufactured to make the best use of the steel being included in the building project. Uh, little to no waste occurs when designing the building. From a structural standpoint, you have the efficient use of steel, thus the tapered primary framing members. And from a material use and fabrication standpoint, everything is cut to size in the shop. Uh, there is a wide range of framing options from clear span to needing interior columns supporting the roof framing members if you so choose to do. And you may ask, how is this sustainable? Well, one of the provisions in the green codes is having the ability for the occupants to have natural daylight and to have direct views to the outside or outside of the building. Metal buildings can be designed to accommodate any interior floor plan needs uh, for the comfort of the occupants in various ways. And one is for their health and well-being as included in a number of the green building provisions. And my last point on this slide would be that traditional materials can be combined with uh, other products such as brick, concrete, and wood. And this will give designers options beyond the traditionally cladded metal building walls. Let's talk about material use now. Metal buildings are typically 30% lighter than conventional construction. And this is due to the economized use of the steel to create the tapered columns and rafters, along with the light frame cold form framing such as secondary framing for the purlins and girts, and the uh, lightweight metal roof and wall panels. This also leads to lighter foundations and requiring less concrete than conventional forms of construction. Less material overall compared to other forms of construction means raw, less raw materials are needed to be extracted from the earth, manufactured, fabricated, shipped to the project site and used, uh, which leads to less effect on the environment to create such products if we um, utilize light construction techniques. Other elements that at first glance may not be considered green would be that steel is non-combustible and has the ability to be fire rated to a certain level uh, to allow either one, two, or three hour ratings when other material assemblies are included in the roof or the wall. As the green codes evolve, a new sustainability concept is being worked in called resiliency. Although this term resiliency is not fully defined, and it's um, fairly a new concept being pushed um, in the uh, green codes. Uh, the goal would be to have resilient structures capable to withstand catastrophic events. And one of this may be fire. So I've tacked on resiliency in general as another attribute uh, that I don't fully get into, but um, just thinking about the fire um, um, option here. Other benefits of, benefits of steel include metal buildings would be the recycled and recyclable content. Much of the material that goes into making new steel products comes from material that has been recycled. And of course, steel that is used in metal buildings is 100% recyclable, meaning it can be brought back, melted back down, and made into new products. And lastly, at the bottom of the slide is indoor environmental quality, also known as IEQ. Now, this plays an important role of keeping the building occupants healthy in the short and long term. Uh, green construction codes and rating systems devote entire chapters on this subject. And one of the items would be to limit the amount of volatile organic chemicals, or VOCs, allowed to be breathed in as a product off gases. VOC limits are in place for products painted or coated within the building. 
However, priming, painting, and coating of steel products used in metal buildings are often handled within the manufacturer's plants. Uh, by doing so, this limits the amount of VOC that is emitted within the building that's being constructed. There are many benefits of having a product or system manufactured off-site. Another one would be less building site disturbance. This is another green provision. Materials and products commonly stored on site by other forms of construction would need to be stored, cut to sized, framed, and all the while the uh, area around the building pad or the building envelope is being uh, affected and thus more uh, damage occurs to the habitat and the landscaping. You know, with metal buildings, all products are cut to size in the shop with little to no waste. And even if there is a small percentage of waste within the shop, it is reused for other products such as bracing members or various other means, or it's recycled again and brought back through the whole process again to make new products. I don't have time to list all the benefits, again, of manufacturing off-site, uh, but one of the benefits includes keeping the site footprint low to the point of simply erecting the building uh, directly off the transportation trucks or to use a building slab as a staging area. Now, this is important if one wants to protect the landscape and habitat around the building itself as much as possible, or if you're in an urban area, which is another green principle to provide uh, buildings within the urban area without uh, affecting uh, the uh, surrounding area. And of that case, uh, you're probably minimal room between buildings or you have a number of access points that limits how and where to stage the materials. Since I mentioned transportation, one of the green provisions includes selecting materials that are available locally, which helps out the local economy. And this gets into the social and economic considerations mentioned earlier. Oftentimes, points or credits or provisions are given for selecting products that are within 500 miles of the building site and 100 miles from the building site within the latest lead version. Without getting into the fine print of those regionally sourced provisions, uh, this map attempts to highlight all the metal building manufacturing plants that are spread across the U.S., which may help contribute to the regional sourcing. Ease of assembly. Uh, ease of assembly is evident on how timely metal building structures are erected. Less time constructing the building means less time on site for all the trays, not just the metal building erectors, and less time to damage the surrounding landscape and habitat. When erecting a metal building system, there is virtually no on site scrap created. Since all the products are cut to size in the manufacturing plant, the only material that may be left over would be the shipping crates or straps used to, to secure the, um, the load as it's being transported to the building site. Still, if there is some steel left over, uh, this should be and would be recycled. In the event that the building occupancy changes or expansion is needed, uh, the end walls are often designed to be removed and added onto. Uh, this is a green trait as uh, the green codes promote the use of existing buildings or existing products. Uh, so by doing so, this allows the existing building to be reused and repurposed and expanded upon. And from a sustainability pro, pro, uh, perspective, uh, this reduces the need for new material that would have needed to be produced, uh, thus less effect on the environment overall to create these new products when the existing products uh, can and should be used as is. 
As we're wrapping up our next few slides of attributes, uh, let's move on to the topic of metal roofing. As many of these topics, I could devote a whole webinar on this dedicated to why metal roofings contribute to environmentally friendly design and construction, whether it's the long life, less maintenance and replacement, and the ability to withstand intense weather events, resiliency, we could include that, uh, non-combustible traits, lightweight, and of course, recyclable. The list goes on, such as cool roof coatings to mitigate the heat island effects and to help reduce the HVAC loads. The long life of the roof and the use of the standing seam roof ribs uh, provides a great platform for the uh, PV panel attachments or other rooftop accessories that attach to the standing seam roof. Large portions of the green codes and rating systems focus in on reduced water consumption. You know, metal roofs are a great platform to have rainwater runoff in a, in a, in a much cleaner manner than other forms of roof applications such as a build-up roof or other types of roof. And this can be collected for landscaping use or other gray water use purposes. And similar to the roof long life, uh, the metal wall panels provides a long lifespan with minimal replacement needed over its lifetime. Um, just as a side note, uh, the replacement factor is also captured in the what we'll get into a little later on, such as life cycle assessment on how environmentally friendly a tire building system is or how often does a product need to be replaced with new products. Uh, so the, this and other replacement factors are included in those types of resources. Energy efficiency is a great attribute that we have. And this is an area that is often associated with green building construction, even beyond the base energy codes. The goal here is to reduce the amount of energy needed to operate the building. And thus, and this can be done by various means, such as reducing the HVAC loads, the plug loads, reduction thereof, uh, reducing the lighting loads, and lifting. Uh, one area that we can contribute would be in the area of increased levels of insulation that is possible within the roof and the wall. The cavity of the purlins in the girts allows the ability to fill the cavity with various levels of insulation to either meet the uh, high R value or the low U factor needs of the project. Our energy design guide uh, that we have published uh, it was originally published back in 2010, addresses a lot of the energy code requirements, and this is currently being revised to address the latest energy code provisions. And that second edition should come out within the next few months. I captured some of the um, insulation assemblies for the walls and the roof. Uh, that will be in, in the next edition. Uh, so this shows how fiberglass could be used as one material option to insulate the building. And this moves away from the traditional single layer of insulation that we are all used to for a number of years, and that's compressed between the girt and the wall panel. Now as the energy codes have become more stringent, and more so with the green building codes and rating systems that attempts to go well beyond the base code. Uh, you now have the option to fill the cavity with the appropriately listed um, U factor or thermal properties for a single cavity filled system and a, and a uh, uh, double layer cavity filled system. One is compressed and one just fills a cavity and we all should be familiar with the cavity-filled roof systems uh, that has been in place for a few code cycles. 
And if you want to go beyond the cavity, you can always add in a layer of continuous insulation, whether it be rigid foam board or other forms of continuous insulation uh, that could be attached to the outside of the secondary frame member. And for the wall, that could be in the interior or the exterior. And more about this will be covered in the energy design guide. Performance. I believe this is my last slide on the attributes. Uh, this is a one I would like to highlight, that all metal buildings are custom designed to meet the needs of a project to be based on local building codes and energy codes. And whether you would like to include the uh, green building code provisions or rating system provisions or if you're working with an uh, engineer or designer who wants to kind of pick and choose without going through the whole regulatory process to use the entire green codes, for example, um, uh, metal buildings can easily accommodate, accommodate those green provisions. So this slide highlights the various attributes mentioned and the resources that MBMA has to support uh, each of these items. And although some of these items are considered single attributes that may be used as standalone traits, where the manufacturer would be able to validate each of these items on their own, uh, there are also many of these that could be studied as a whole. Uh, for more of a multi-attribute perspective. So we'll run through the list here real quick. Uh, this is the life cycle assessment report that we'll get into more detail in the next few slides, along with EPDs, environmental product declarations. We'll also review the whole building life cycle assessment tool called the impact estimator. And another resource to validate our understanding on how to compare metal building is against other forms of construction. We have uh, some case studies to review with you. And of course, mbma.com has a wealth of information for each of these items listed here to the left of the slide. and our four standalone publications. The Metal Building Systems Manual uh, focuses more on the structural provisions. The Fire Resistance Design Guide focuses, of course, on the fire provisions and includes a number of insulation assemblies that are fire rated. Uh, the Energy Design Guide that I've already mentioned uh, that will be, we'll put out a second edition and we have our roofing systems manual that, uh, again, more focuses in on the structural and some of the fire provisions. So although many of the elements that we reviewed, and we all know that metal buildings are inherently green, there are guidelines to validate the various green characteristics of metal buildings. We need to avoid the appearance of uh, uh, greenwashing. There are many labels out there uh, that attempt to say a particular product is green. However, many of, uh, of course, many of these are valid and many of these may not be as, as uh, structured or rigorous as others. With over 500 eco labels in the U.S. and abroad, the consumer definitely has a hard time understanding these labels and if they are truly valid. As a result, many construction industries began to validate their own statements of being sustainable by utilizing international standards. And this is where MBMA focused their attention within the Sustainability Committee. Uh, utilizing third-party validate, validator resources uh, that quantifies a number of the sustainable traits highlighted earlier. This would include our life cycle assessment, 
the EPD summaries, environmental product declaration summaries, and the whole building LCA tool called the impact estimator. The first resource I would like to review with you is the life cycle assessment work. From a high level view, I'd like to define LCA and the resulting resources that has become available to the metal building industry and the design community. As mentioned, there are single attributes that are handled individually by product suppliers, such as where your product is extracted, harvested, manufactured, and distance traveled to the site, recycled content, and how long the product or building will likely last. And the list goes on. LCA, or life cycle assessment, looks at the big picture of the product, which in turn would contribute to the whole building life cycle assessment. This would assess the entire building compared to other building or product types within that building. LCA looks at the following items from extraction and forming of the raw materials to shipping to the manufacturer's plant to be fabricated and further developed into the final product, which is eventually shipped out to the project site to be erected in the building and the components put in use, and then at the end of life, it is uh, uh, dismantled, hopefully recycled back into the process and with no materials sent to a landfill. So this is where MBMA spent a considerable amount of time in taking a look at the big picture and how metal buildings affects the environment. This is another image that uh, was taken from the World Steel Association website that illustrates uh, the um, generic graph that I provided in the earlier slide for the LCA process. Again, this is focusing in on steel production, but more in a general way and not just metal buildings. And of course, our LCA focused in on metal buildings from extraction of the raw material to steel production to the forming of the raw materials, whether it be the metal coils, or the, whether it's a bar stock or plates, any recycled or any material left over from forming those raw materials are recycled and brought back into the loop. Once the final product, like such as the coils, are completed, they would be shipped to the metal building manufacturer's plant, refabricated, and then put in use on the building site, recycled, and the loop continues on and on. Or at least that's the ultimate goal for it to continue. Well, I said I would stay at a higher level, but let's touch upon some of the details associated with having a quality eco-label. The purpose of the next few slides is to show you the complexity of the process that MBMA went through in order to validate many of, uh, of our environmental traits. The main governing body that the construction industry uses as a whole to quantify LCA claims would be the International Organization for Standards, for Standardization, or ISO. The main driver to get everyone unified in the United States, in my mind, was a lead green building rating system, and which had followed suit into the other green codes and standards. Uh, thus, the ISO standards are referenced in those green reference documents. ISO defines three categories of eco labels. Type 1 and Type 2 are not as tough to meet as Type 3. However, the focus area of the green codes or green buildings centers around type 3. And the various ISO standards, such as shown, and the one European standard, the EN 15804. And these various ones help develop life cycle assessments, which are based on product category rules, or PCRs, 
which in turn is then summarized into EPDs, Environmental Product Declarations. I'm only touching on the surface of the alphabet soup uh, that you may run into when uh, working with green construction design concepts, uh, but some of the more common terms would be what I just stated, the LCA, PCR, and EPD. And I'll throw in a few others for good measure. So of course our LCA work focusing on type 3 and we use these ISO standards. So what is a life cycle assessment? Now this is a scientific approach evaluating the potential environmental impacts of a product throughout its life cycle. There are four variants of LCAs as shown on the screen here. So I'll start from the one on the bottom of the screen and work my way up. Uh, the uh, gate to gate, uh, this is useful from a metal building manufacturer's perspective and what was included in our studies. Uh, this would have the details on what went into manufacturing your product in-house within your warehouse, meaning when you receive the raw material at the back gate, and refashioned and assembled further to produce a final product that is shipped out the front gate. And out the front gate it would be ultimately transported to the project site. Moving on up we have cradle to gate which expands this a little bit further and includes a gate to gate analysis. But now we introduce the term cradle. And cradle for our industry would be from the extraction of the raw materials such as iron ore and the forming of the raw materials and the metal coils, uh, uh, R stock and the like. And this material is then shipped to the manufacturer's uh, back gate. Okay, let's move up to the top one there, cradle to grave. Uh, this encompasses all the items below it and we'll talk about uh, crave. <clears throat> a, a crave takes a look at what happens when the product has exceeded its lifespan, meaning it is dismantled or is it recycled or is it sent back to the landfill. And uh, so this is incorporated into cradle to grave. So obviously the environmental, potential environmental impacts would not be as favorable if products are sent to the landfill and a little bit more favorable if it's recycled and brought back into the process. And lastly, there is a cradle to cradle, which is similar to cradle to gray with a more focus in on the recycling process. Lastly, to drill further down, the last uh, bullet point to the left there is if the product, if the LCA is focusing in on product specific, or industry-wide. Our focus, of course, was on industry-wide LCAs, which incorporates the gate-to-gate -gate information and the cradle-to-gate for the products that the manufacturers received, and then rolled into cradle-to-grave, uh, which we'll get into with the whole building life cycle assessment. Uh, and this is handled by the Athena Impact Estimator. To drill down a little bit into the uh, uh, details would be a schematic out of the LCA final report that illustrates what's involved in the cradle to gate analysis. This includes the collection of life cycle inventory, or LCI. See, I threw in another acronym in there. So LCI takes on, takes a look at the manufacturing process uh, this focusing, this one in particular focuses in on primary frames and takes a look at the energy input to rework the hot rolled plate and the various uh, sections to form the columns and the beams. And this does include the uh, framing or the, um, the, the bracing members as well. It takes a look at the upstream information for the cradle to gate for the uh, raw materials. 
the energy input, electricity, fossil fuel, fuels, uh, the transportation to get the raw materials to the manufacturer's plant, and the water input to uh, assist in fabricating the product. Any waste developed within this gate-to-gate -gate process? and anything that is recycled back to the process. And how this contributes to the emissions to the air, water, and soil. So the same process went on. The same level of LCI, life cycle inventory, was reviewed for the secondary framing members for the Perlins and Gertz. And this just illustrates what all was reviewed, such as coil slitting, punching and shearing, roll forming, painting if applicable, packaging, and shipping, getting ready for it to be shipped out. Lastly, there's information for the roof and wall panels, similar in what we noted before. After the completion of the LCI and LCA study, uh, the various environmental impacts or potential environmental impacts are then quantified and based off a specific unit measure. So far in our case, it was one ton of product. What is one ton of primary framing members, one ton of secondary uh, framing members, and then one ton of the roof or wall cladding. Now this slide highlights the seven impact areas that affect the atmosphere, water, and earth, from global warming to ozone depletion to the, to the depletion of fossil fuels. And there's, um, within this industry-wide study, there are, there are quite a few tables. This is just one excerpt out of uh, our, the resources that you will have access to. Uh, this one, uh, in particular, comes out of uh, out of our environmental product uh, declarations, where it quantifies the potential environmental impacts of the uh, various product stages based on a per short ton, and then it does include the per metric ton, since our EPDs were conformed based off of product category rules which doesn't just focus in on the U.S. way to measure or quantify products, but more towards the, what is typically used outside of the U.S. for SI units. So the work done during the LCA study has fed into projects uh, that represents metal building systems in the sustainable construction marketplace. In an effort to try to keep this level, this information at a high level, let's run through the remaining resources available. LCI, Life Cycle Inventory, provides the information to determine the environmental impacts. This LCI data was, of course, the basis for the LCA final report, along with four other resources. For LCA practitioners, they now have the LCI data within the NREL US LCI database for their use with their own whole building LCA software tools. And then the metal building has the LCI data included within the whole building LCA tool, specifically the Athena Impact Estimator, in order to represent our industry. And another resource that kind of rolls in a lot of this information would be the Walter P. Moore Impact Estimator Case Study Project. And lastly, uh, these LCA information is summarized in the environmental product declarations. So let's quickly run through what the Athena Impact or <laughs> what the Athena Impact Estimator includes and how uh, you could use this to promote metal buildings. 
This tool is capable of modeling 95% of the building stock in North America uh, using the LCI data I mentioned earlier. For our products and other products used by other industries or suppliers. One can use a simplified approach uh, that is included within the impact estimator via the drop-down menus to come up with rough results for the potential environmental impacts. And this is an area that MBMA worked with Athena on to include a metal building system solution. An alternative would be the uh, bill of material route where rather than going with the drop-down menus, one could specifically uh, detail out a metal building or other forms of construction, figure out the, all the material that would need to be specified and likely shipped to the site or manufactured, and this, this would be rolled into the whole building life cycle assessment. So let's just review a couple of screenshots associated with the software and then the metal building system solution drop-down menus. So for the primary framing, we have the second screenshot there, but let's circle back to the first screenshot. Uh, one can pick a number of the, of the locations in the United States and various building types and the building life expectancy. In the past, the magic number that was often referred to was a 60-year lifespan, uh, but uh, somewhat recently, it, this is the, the norm, the number to shoot for within these whole building LCAs is 75 years. So for my quick example here, I'll pick Atlanta. The building type is commercial. I suspect the building will last 75 years. I'll use the uh, imperial. US, met, US uh, measurements, and my building height will be 20 feet, and my gross floor area will be 25,000 square feet. Moving on to the second um, drop-down menu, which focuses in on metal buildings, columns, and themes for the uh, uh, primary framing, tapered framing members. And I entered in some information just to show you what is uh, what will the output be. So building length is 250 feet, the building width 100 feet. I put no interior columns. However, this tool does have limitations when using the drop-down menus and not going with the bill of material route because it as assumes that the building can only do a clear span up to 100 feet. And we know that is, uh, we can go well beyond that. I put a live load of 20 pounds per square foot. Moving on to the walls, I put in a non-hurricane prone region. Uh, so it does some calculations in the uh, background of the tool. Non-hurricane because I chose Atlanta. I assume 26 gauge uh, metal panels. Moving on to the roof drop-down menu, uh, this would include the purlins and the roof panels. Uh, the previous one would uh, include the LCI information for the girts and the wall panels. But getting back to the uh, roof panel, I enter, entered more information in on the roof width and length, a type of roof, and I went 24 gauge because I wanted this to be a standing seam roof. And, and I looked at a few of the reports. So this is a report that is generated within the software tool. And I'm only highlighting what's included with our you know, rough framing, primary framing, secondary framing, and the metal cladding. And so this outlines the uh, materials that would be used, the quantities, and the weights in short tons. So moving on, let's move, change uh, topics sort of into the Walter P. Moore Impact Estimator Case Study Project. We engaged an outside uh, prominent engineering firm to take a look at the impact estimator 
and to try to make comparisons against metal buildings and see how we fare uh, against other forms of construction. Uh, we, we, we wanted to be more hands-off and just to see what would come out of this. So this would be validated by a third party, more or less, meaning we uh, engage Walter P. Moore to take a look and see what they come up with. So this is a spreadsheet, uh, spreadsheet or matrix that is derived from the case study report. And we took a look at, at uh, three building sizes, and we just labeled them A, B, and C, and, and uh, three building types as far as for end use. We located them in three areas of the country so we can capture the high wind loads for Florida, high seismic loads for California, and high snow loads for Minnesota. And with this includes our metal building example and some of the details that are included in the report. And we compared ourselves against wood, masonry, concrete, and conventional wide flan steel construction. So here's some excerpts out of the report to show how I involved how Walter P. Moore took a look at the information to ensure that there was an accurate bill of materials generated and not using the prescriptive or drop-down menus included in the tool. So they looked at the various occupancy categories uh, this kind of reiterates the building sizes, uh, building end use. What codes and standards these various buildings were um, designed to? Again, there were, there were 30 different case studies if you go back and look at that uh, matrix. And there was obviously some material design assumptions since these were not real uh, uh, buildings being built for clients. So they made some assumptions. Uh, these are just some of the assumptions that I extracted from the report. And one of the locations I extracted here was for California. So it was definitely site specific. We arbitrarily picked locations in the US or in California, Florida, and Minnesota. This one was uh, pretty close to a fault line and went through all the various loads that would be needed for a typical engineering construction project. And the outcome would be a chart. There are various charts within this report. So a series of tables and with the metal buildings shown as the baseline in blue. The potential environmental impacts used in the impact estimator and in the referenced uh, green codes and rating systems are shown at the bottom of the screen, such as global warming through to the non-renewable energy. So our example, we picked uh, the, just one of the case studies. We picked a medium-sized building here to show you on the screen, comparing metal building against masonry wall construction with a conventional type of roofing system with open, open bar joists and a uh, build-up roof. And this takes a look at three locations in the U.S. for this particular size of building. Uh, the uh, uh, bar chart um, shows, the middle, shows the middle building example as a baseline, as I mentioned earlier. And then if the, if the building type affects the environment more in a negative way, it, it goes higher than the in the 100% for the baseline. However, if it goes lower than the baseline, uh, then that means they are um, handle the potential environmental impacts a little bit better than metal building system. Uh, for this particular example, um, metal buildings, uh, as you can see, as far handles the environmental impacts in a far better way than the metal building versus and masonry type construction. 
I realize that I breezed through a lot of this information, uh, such as the LCA, the impact estimator, and then the Walter P. Moore study even more quickly. But we have set up a separate webinar to get down into the uh, details a little bit further. Uh, so we have a tentative date uh, set for September 21st uh, that will be hosted by Jamie Mile of the Athena Institute. He was the consultant that worked with MBMA to, de to develop the LCAs and was involved a, just a little bit in the EPD work. So he'll review what the, a little more details on LCAs and how the various green codes and rating system addresses this topic and what they might request and what you might receive uh, as a request to meet the needs of those green codes. Who we'll also take a live review of the impact estimator. Uh, we ask them to provide one example using the drop-down menus and take an example out of the Walter P. Moore case study uh, to provide a little bit more um, review if you go with the bill of material route. Okay, let's switch gears now to environmental product declarations. Uh, this is another resource that is afforded to you. EPDs are uh, based off of the LCI work uh, that is summarized in the LCA report. And this has been created to conform to the product category rules. So the, um, so the product category rules are the PCRs. PCRs outlines what needs to be included throughout the whole process, what should be included within the LCA analysis, and what is summarized in the information provided in the EPDs. So we use two PCRs for our purposes. One provided the rules for the primary and secondary framing work in a separate PCR for the metal roof and the wall panel analysis. So there are three EPDs. Uh, the first one I like to highlight is a primary structural steel frame components as was titled. Uh, we worked with UL Environment or also known as uh, ULE. Uh, this particular EPD summarizes the life cycle assessment information contained in the final report for the tapered, rigid columns and themes. And the full LCA report is about 130 pages. Uh, the EPDs, they're generated more as a summary fashion to capture the pertinent quantified information and typically they're around uh, 12 pages or so. So we have three EPDs. They're basically formatted the same, such as our secondary framing EPD, and then our roof and wall metal panel EPD. Now the EPDs, uh, they, they provide uh, when you're working with architects or the uh, designers, more, more, more transparency and information that is more easily readable than like a full LCA report. It does include some, some marketing information as a high level, uh, just to kind of, kind of uh, uh, promote the use of metal buildings or each of these components. Uh, but a lot of the information needs to be scientifically um, validated and use the information that is uh, contained in the So just a couple of from the primary framing EPD just to show you what it does include. So this one here just provides more information on MBMA. Uh, since this is an industry-wide EPD that the, those who supply metal building, primary framing, secondary framing, and the roof and wall panels, uh, they are allowed to use this EPD. So the ownership is shown here in the second uh, subsection. 
more of a product product description is shown here for the architect or a designer to use or to review to understand what he is getting and a little bit more information about the product as a whole. And there are a couple pages of what the codes and standards that are typically used by the industry and this is just a small portion of it. And then this offers a little bit more information on the quantified levels of the potential environmental impacts in a table format and other types of formats are included in the EPD. Uh, so this will show more transparency on how the product would affect the environment on a per ton basis or a per metric ton basis. And a little more information. So the, the intent is to not to review this in detail, but just to show you what is available to you and what was all involved in the just in rigorous process to get to the point to provide these resources to the industry. So we have engaged ULE staff to provide a webinar on August 10th. That is a confirmed date and time. And there you'll understand the scope of the EPDs a lot more than what I provided here. And where in the green building codes does it call out EPDs and how much are they worth? and what information uh, could be used to um, when uh, specifying EPDs for various products. And then I, we asked the ULE to provide a little bit more information on the industry-wide EPDs versus product-specific EPDs. Uh, so this may be of interest to the metal building manufacturers who may want to have their own EPDs that represents their own company as opposed to the industry-wide EPDs. So these are all the resources and these are all located on mbma.com. Uh, so they're there for your viewing and for your use. So we view the various attributes and you can see that we are and have always been inherently green. However, uh, we needed to provide resources without just saying we're green as other industries have provided LCAs and EPDs and we needed to be as transparent to so we can uh, compare all products against other forms of construction if needed. The last topic I would like to address with everyone would be the, the general scope of the green code standards and rating systems without getting down into the individual provisions. The primary drivers would be the IGCC, which is the International Green Construction Code, and this is addressed by the ICC or the International Code Council. Then we have the ASHRAE Green Building Standard, which is the ASHRAE 189.1. And another driver for all these green provisions is LEED. LEED is managed by the U.S. Green Building Council. And LEED stands for Leadership in Energy and Environmental Design. So the common themes in the IGCC, 189.1 and LEED centers around six major areas. I highlighted some of the metal building attributes that fits into most of these six categories, you know, which I left out the last one there called commissioning. Uh, there are chapters and major sections of each of these reference documents that focus in on each of these six items. So such as sustainable sites, which would be the one item that I already called out would, would be the protection of the habitat or around the building area and includes the, in the cool roof uh, provisions or the heat island provisions. 
water efficiency, such as rainwater collection, as one of the many provisions within that chapter or chapters. Energy efficiency, which uh, provides or attempts to provide a percentage improvement over the base energy code, typically about 5 to 10 percent more stringent. Uh, so this would increase the layers or increase the amount of insulation or levels of insulation, increase the, how thermally efficient the windows, doors, and skylights are, and increasing the air barrier provisions as well. Moving on to the right side of the screen, the indoor environmental quality, such as low VOC emittance, increased acoustic provisions that I really didn't touch upon within this webinar, and the materials and resource chapters. Uh, this is the main area that MBMA focused to create the resources that you now have today. And then lastly, commissioning. And this takes a look at ensuring that the building components and functions are installed properly and are actually performing as originally specified. Uh, this is one area uh, that has been a focus in the green codes and standards uh, development. Uh, so they're, they're looking to expand the commissioning language that is available now within the green codes uh, to ensure that the building performs and products are installed as originally specified. I mentioned the baseline code. So for commercial metal building applications, I was thinking of the IBC, International Building Code. But there are other I codes out there, seven or eight of them, International Fire Code, International Plumbing Code. So in, in short, um, the I code that I was thinking of was the IBC. And this, in turn, re references an energy code overseen by the International Code Council called the International Energy Conservation Code. And then the optional compliance path would get to the ASHRAE 90.1 energy standard. And so we focus on these two topics within our energy design guide. Now to change this or make this work with this presentation on sustainability, we also have the International Green Construction Code. Uh, this is the cover image of the current version that's available, 2015. And there is an optional compliance path within the IGCC. We'll get to the ASHRAE 189.1. Uh, the green building provisions are written in mandatory code language for jurisdictions to include this with their other codes that they would like the uh, construction projects to adhere to. Uh, so whether one chooses the IGCC or 189.1. As a, as a side note, these are two standalone reference documents. Uh, but, however, to increase the interest by municipalities or hoping to gain more interest by municipalities to begin enforcing one of these, uh, the ASHRAE in ICC has joined forces to work on only one publication that would be available in the United States. So it will only be one of these reference documents come 2018. However, these two entities will work hand in hand to create those provisions. And lastly, LEED. LEED version 4 is the latest version that's out there. The current version that you may be familiar with is LEED 2009, sometimes known as LEED version 3. Uh, there was a lot of changes made to version 4. Uh, that was completed a year or two ago. However, because the amount of changes, the USGBC uh, indicated they would hold off on sunsetting the 2009 version of LEED. So that uh, time frame is nearing the end. And so all new 
construction projects wanting to use a voluntary lead rating system come November of this year, 2016, would need to register under the lead version 4 system. And this is a primary driver for all the industries to create uh, transparency documents for LCA and the EPDs, along with many other green provisions that we don't have time to review in this webinar. For more information about all these resources and the other attributes that you can uh, continue to promote the use and cons construction we have a fairly new website that was revised uh, about a year ago, and we recently refined the energy and sustainability content within the past six months that you may not be aware of. So if you ever need any of the resources that we cited today, such as the LCA, EPDs, or more information about the impact estimator software and the Walter P. Moore case study, uh, you can go to this particular portion of the website. We also drafted or uh, crafted a whole lead version 4 rating system uh, commentary. If you go to this portion of the website, that will list uh, various lead version 4 credits that could and possibly would be applicable to metal buildings, uh, just in case you're working on a lead project. Uh, but many of those um, items is transferable to the IGCC or 189.1. Lastly, I'd like to point out another resource to you would be SRI. SRI is a steel recycling institute, and they are affiliated with the American Iron and Steel Institute or AISI. So if you go to this website, as shown on the screen here, you'll find a lot of information of interest uh, in order to promote steel as a whole. Uh, just a couple extracts out of the SRI resources. If you are an LCA practitioner or working with an architect who would like to have more information uh, for life cycle inventory, uh, this is a resource that can be used. The uh, SRI has um, this information that can be requested that includes the LCI data of the raw material that gets shipped to the metal building manufacturer's back gate, such as the cold rolled coil, hot dip galvanized steel plate and structural sections that takes a look at the uh, cradle to steel mill gate inventory uh, that would be ready for shipment to steel product manufacturers and fabricators. Lastly, they also have a steel takes a lead document that provides a detailed commentary on industry-wide steel recycling rates. Uh, this is useful for the current LEED 2009 version, and this document is also referenced in the International Green Construction Code. However, this uh, document is, is getting updated or reworked uh, to include other LEED credits as it relates to steel construction in general, and this will be posted on the SR website soon. So, in closing, whether you are engaging in a project seeking to specify green construction principles with or without the involvement of the green codes, standards, or rating system provisions, uh, you now have the resources available to you to encourage the use of metal buildings in the sustainable green building construction arena. If you do have any questions along the way, feel free to contact me. Uh, you'll have this handout. This handout will be emailed to you in electronic format at some point after today's webinar, or you can use contact us form on our website, and it'll come directly to me uh, to answer any of your energy or sustainability type questions. 
But if you have any questions now, feel free to ask, and we'll see if I can point you in the right direction. Well, very good. Thank you, Jay, for that presentation. Very informative, and uh, this is a great time uh, for you to ask your questions. We, we either have the question box that you can type your questions in. If you'd like, you can also use the chat box, or feel free at this point to raise your hand. Uh, if you'd like to ask Jay any questions while we have him live on the line here. Jay, there is one question that I thought of, and I, I heard you mention this before. You talked about single attribute claims and multiple attribute claims, and I wondered what the difference was between those two things. Yes, that's a good question. I have, have heard that question before. In the older Ash, in the older, like ASHRAE 189.1 or in the earlier IGCC document, and in particular to LEAD, uh, in the past they only focused in on single topics, in which is often known as single attributes. In the one chapter uh, that I describe for the material and resources, so they often focus in on recycled content. If your product is harvested, such as a, you know the wood industry would harvest their product, or if it's regionally sourced, you know things of that nature. Uh, this was prior to the advent of the LCA or whole building LCA concept. However, with the past two versions of LEED, and of course uh, what's been followed suit by the IGCC and 189.1 is to take a more holistic approach to use uh, to try to quantify more than one attribute, thus the term multi-attribute. So for our case, it would take a look at the regionally sourced material, how far it traveled, get to the plant, and out to the site, recycle content, what's recyclable, and the whole nine yards. Okay, good. That answered my question. Thank you. Um, any other questions from the audience? You can raise your hand if you'd like to do that. I, I've got another one, uh, Jay, that someone asked me recently, and I thought I would just see if you could answer it on, on the line here. It has to do with our environmental product declarations. Now, we've got our three environmental product declarations, so I wondered, is it possible uh, to compare... EPDs, like for instance the metal building EPDs versus another product e EPD in a different construction type? Mm, yeah, um, not really. Um, that's the, the, uh, in the end, that's the ultimate uh, goal is to compare EPDs against other product types, but at this point um, EPDs really can't be compared with other products. The only way that they can be compared if they use the same product category rule. I kind of briefly touched on PCRs and more information will be provided in the next webinar on that topic. But if a uh, industry uses the same product category rules, uh, then uh, technically they could compare. But, uh, but, but for right now, EPDs are not comparable against other forms of construction. Okay, good. So seeing no other questions, I'd like to just say thank you to Jay Johnson as our presenter today. We'd also like to acknowledge the support we've gotten from the American Iron and Steel Institute and their partnership in helping us develop uh, the product category rules and also in, in consulting with us on our EPDs. Uh, it's a great partnership and we appreciate their help. Thank you very much. Have a great afternoon, everyone.